All right, so let's start with the big story that we are tracking on Vion at this hour, where a gas pipeline that was recently constructed between Russia and Germany has become the focus as the West and Russia are trying to de-escalate the tensions over the crisis that has unfolded after Russians amassed almost over 100,000 troops along the border with Ukraine. In the latest, the United States, in a very strong statement, has said that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline will be at stake if Russia decides to carry out an incursion into Ukraine. With regard to Nord Stream 2, uh, we continue to have uh, very strong and clear conversations uh, with our German allies, and I want to be clear with you today. If Russia invades Ukraine, one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. Meanwhile, the German foreign minister has told the parliament that her government was working on a pretty strong package of sanctions alongside allies that will include the Nord Stream 2. Now, Germany's new chancellor, Olaf Scholz, is scheduled to visit the White House on the 7th of February and discuss the crisis with President Biden. Since its inception, the Nord Stream 2 has been Europe's most divisive energy project. It is a project that is said to be worth almost about $11 billion. And the pipeline runs from western Siberia to Germany, running parallel to Nord Stream 1. It connects the Ust Luga in Russia with the Griefswald in northeastern Germany. The pipeline makes Germany's dependence on Russia even bigger. And the Nord Stream 2 could, of course, heat up as many as about 26 million German homes with cheaper Russian gas, enabling Germany to act more independently on the energy market. Now, here's a graph to in fact show us to how dependent Germany happens to be on Russia for its gas power needs. In December 2021, Russian pipeline gas was Germany's biggest supply source. For Berlin, losing this large chunk of gas imports will of course be very detrimental. To compensate this, it will require to increase its coal-fired generation of power back at home or import power from its neighbours. For Western Europe, Russia is its single largest supplier of economically priced gas. Should Russia choose to cut off its gas supplies, then this could lead to absolute chaos across the continent. Energy costs would simply go through the roof and millions would have to deal with power outages, especially in the middle of a pretty bitter winter. So what options does Europe have for now? Currently, it is depending on the United States to look for alternate supplies. The United States is working over time to shore up supplies from Qatar, this isn't a silver bullet that Europe needs right now, but emergency supplies from Qatar could sustain for the moment. Australia too has offered to provide some additional natural gas for Europe, and if Russia decides to cut off energy supplies, these are some of the alternate measures that Europe could of course resort to, but this has become a point of contention in the negotiations that are ongoing over the Ukraine crisis. And also to give us more insights in terms of how all of these negotiations are, of course, proceeding, we're joined in by our correspondent, Rosie Burchard, who is joining us live from Brussels. Now, good afternoon to you, Rosie. This, this, of course, is a very crucial aspect in the discussions on how the West can actually respond to this challenge posed by the Russians. Nord Stream 2, there's a lot of talk that's, in fact, been going on. Will Germany put this on stake in providing a united front against Russia? Well, there certainly has been a lot of talk going on. I will say that Nord Stream 2 has been a political fault line in Europe for some time now, for many weeks and months when I've been standing across the road as ministers and prime ministers arrive for talks on various issues, many of them, particularly from the Baltic and Eastern European countries that are advocates of a harder line in relations with Russia, have been telling us journalists that they want Germany to put Nord Stream 2 on the table for sanctions in case of a Russian invasion, and some of them say that it simply should never have happened in the first place. Let's note Nord Stream 2 is not yet certified, so it's not yet up and running, but Germany's line had long been that it was not a political project. And with this announcement from the German Foreign Minister, Annalena Baerbock, in Parliament, it seems that Germany has really changed tack. Now, this does come at a time when Germany overall in Europe is coming under fire, uh, for its position in this Ukraine crisis. We know that it has exposed itself as an outlier on some issues in the last couple of days and weeks. So, for example, when it comes to arms exports, Germany has uh, suggested that 
sending weapons to Ukraine, particularly lethal weapons, could simply send the wrong message when diffusing tensions is the number one priority. Germany says it is 100 percent on Ukraine's side and has showed that by its willingness to send materials for a field hospital and, uh, and helmets. But this is something which uh, is popular at home in Germany, but it's certainly putting it at odds with some other European countries. The Latvian foreign minister this morning had some scathing criticism for Germany. He said its uh, relationship with Russia at the moment was proving immoral and its hesitancy towards using military force was simply absurd within the current time. So we can say that while this news from Germany on Nord Stream 2 and sanctions will be music to the ears and will be welcomed for some countries here, others will say it simply does not go far enough. Absolutely indeed. And the other big issue that we of course want to talk about is, is what the United Kingdom has said where it has warned some of its top firms to in fact beware of the possibility of uh, cyber attacks by the Russians. You know, how, how is Europe looking at this? Well, uh, uh, here in Europe we've had some briefings. I've just come off a briefing uh, with, uh, with officials that are certainly concerned about cyber attacks. And they're also warning about disinformation. But we know that still here the priority is to pursue a diplomatic track. So the diplomacy continues today. We know some NATO allies in the West have put troops on standby ready to deploy to the east of the alliance. But standby is the operative word today. So we know uh, NATO and the US have sent proposals to Russia on how they uh, propose to try and resolve this crisis. And Russia has said for now it needs time to look into these. But meanwhile, the French President Emmanuel Macron, who's really trying taking a step forward and trying to take a lead on this in Europe, uh, we understand he's due to have a phone call with his Russian counterpart, uh, the President Vladimir Putin, and talks in the Normandy format, so that's Ukraine, Russia, France and Germany, and one of the few places where Ukraine and Russia really sit eye to eye across the table from each other, are expected to take place again in the coming two weeks at the level of officials. So it does seem that while uh, the preparedness continues, so preparedness for cyber attacks and preparedness to shore up natural gas supplies is certainly ongoing. First and foremost, um, today, it certainly is this uh, diplomatic talks which are continuing, no side yet ready to throw in the towel. Uh, they will try to seek some uh, agreement from the West side, at least on issues such as arms control or greater transparency on military exercises. But overall, the divisions between these sides on bigger issues, for example, whether or not Ukraine should ever be allowed to join the NATO alliance, uh, are, the, the sides remain very far apart. And it's really harder to see where they could find agreement on these bigger questions that so bitterly divide them. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Rosie Burchett, for joining us and getting us all those updates from Brussels then. Vion is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.